like many things that one does, it happens partly by design and to a significant extent by pure chance and, and accident. The design element was as follows. About 20 years ago, I was reading uh, a, a very interesting Italian treatise on the Ottoman Empire by Lanzaro Soranzo, written in, uh, published in 1598. And he said at one point, um, there's this very important uh, treatise on uh, the Ottoman Empire in Europe, which you should read. And then two pages later, he said, and about the Albanians, if you want to know more about them, you must read that manuscript treatise by their compatriot, Lord Compatriota, Antonio Bruni. And I nearly fell off my chair at that point because I thought, here is a text, 16th century treatise about Albanians by an Albanian, but is completely unknown. Nobody has ever referred to this. Uh, it, it's just unknown. And if I could find it, it would be the first known uh, text about Albania by an Albanian. So I started hunting, and it took about 16 to 17 years. <laughs> I found it, uh, in the end, more by chance than by design, and an awful lot of design had gone into my wild goose cases. It's in the Vatican Library. I rushed off and read it. It's a very interesting text. It's not very long. Um, it's an Italian little Italian treatise. I thought, well, I'll publish it, and with a little introduction about the author. And that was where the problems began, because I knew nothing about this man except his name, which is a very common apparently Italian name, Antonio Bruni, and on the title page it said he was from Dolcino. So he was from what is now Ulcin uh, in Montenegro, Ulcin for Albanians, um, which has always been an Albanian speaking town. It's on the southern tip of Montenegro, very close to the Albanian border. So I started digging, metaphorically speaking. Uh, I found some more details about his family, and gradually, figure after figure emerged from total gloom and I just couldn't believe what I was uncovering. So, just for example, his father turned out to be a knight of Malta, uh, who was talent spotted by the Pope, was sent as um, intelligence uh, organizer to Dubrovnik, was then made captain of the papal flagship at the Battle of Lepanto. He served as captain of the papal flagship in the papal fleet for three campaigns, was then sent as an infantry commander to the papal territory of Avignon. So that's just the father. Um, an uncle, that man's brother, became an archbishop, primate of all Serbia with dozens of bishops under him, went to the last session of the Council of Trent, played an absolutely crucial role in important matters at the last session of the Council of Trent, came back to his see uh, in what is now Montenegro, but covering large parts of modern Albania, uh, and comes to a very uh, sticky and, and tragic end at the end of the Battle of Lepanto. Um, he's not actually killed by the Ottomans. I won't spoil the story, but it is a tragic, <laughs> tragic story. So that's just the uncle. Another uncle, uncle by marriage, uh, and this is where there's two families interlock, Brunis and Brutis. The fact the names are almost identical is a total coincidence. Uh, he was the chief diplomatic and, and commercial fixer for Venice in this whole region of the Western Balkans. Um, he was used to solve tricky problems, talking to um, local Ottoman pashas on the other side of the border, because these people are right on the frontier. These people are Albanian citizens, but subjects of Venice. So they're working, they're all Roman Catholics, they're working for the West, but right on in this frontier zone. So he was very important, and he was, as a grain trader, he kept Venice alive, because he was producing or organizing at certain moments, 9,000 tons of grain a year to Venice, which was nearly a quarter of its annual consumption, and without that, Venice would have collapsed. His son, has the most extraordinary career. He goes to Istanbul as a, as a teenager to train as a dragoman, professional interpreter. Um, pretty soon he decides that's not the life for me. So he gets enlisted by the underground Spanish uh, espionage network in Istanbul. Then he goes to Madrid and he's given a very important task to accompany a secret diplomatic mission, a sort of underground diplomatic mission, to negotiate a truce between Philip II of Spain and the Grand Vizier. Um, he does a bit of that, falls out with a Spanish diplomat, and then he goes off to Moldavia and becomes the chief minister of Moldavia, commander of its army, and pretty much runs the whole country. But this is a country inside the Ottoman Empire, so he's ultimately working, in some sense, for the Ottomans for the next um, 12 years. And then he comes to a particularly nasty end, so I won't spoil that for <laughs> um, So, I mean, those are just a few. There are, there are many more. There are dragomans, there's, there, there's someone who almost stops the entire Habsburg Ottoman War that breaks out, the, the so called Long War that breaks out in 1593, is almost stopped by a member of this family. Um, and then, after three years, another member of the family is sent on a peace mission to the Emperor Rudolf 
uh, in Prague in order to stop it again and, and uh, with less chances of, of, of success. So the book at one level is a set of biographies of these people because their family story is extraordinary. These are individuals who all did interesting things. And I've been working for many years in a much broader way on East-West relations in that period and relations between the Christian part of Europe and the Ottoman part. And in practical terms, that covers a spectrum from sort of warfare, piracy, things like that at one end, through espionage to diplomacy, commerce, and then at the other end of the spectrum, Westerners actually working for the Ottomans. And just by chance, members of this family, they filled every single slot on that entire range. So I thought, I will write a, a book, which is a kind of collective biography, tell these stories because they're too good to lose, and at the same time use that as a framework for something much bigger, which is a broader thematic account of all the important ways in which East and West were interacting at that time, and at the same time to try to build up a sort of geopolitical account of what's happening, the, the, the war around the Battle of Lepanto, the outbreak of the Habsburg War. So all of those things. So it's a rather difficult book to describe, and there are, there's more than one element or layer to it, but I hope at least that some, some parts of it work. Those are the main points of it. It just so happens that as I write about this stuff and as I do research, I keep stumbling on more Albanians. They're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> there are Albanian soldiers, cavalry officers in Italy. Um, there are Albanians, of course, in the Ottoman administration in Istanbul. In fact, one reason why these people do well in Istanbul is that they have a more distant cousin who has become Grand Vizier. He is actually running the Ottoman Empire, and he's an Albanian from a little village called Topoyan, which I visited and walked around, looked at the fountain of Sinan Pasha Topoyan and, and so on. So, um, just to give you an idea, a, a, the book ends at the end of the 16th century. This terrible Habsburg Ottoman War has broken out. And by about 1600, um, it's devastating parts of Central Europe, Transylvania, Wallachia, and so on, what is now southern part of Romania. But at the moment where I finished the book, the chief commander in the field on the Ottoman side is called uh, Yemishchi Hassan Pasha. Uh, he is an Albanian, uh, probably the nephew of uh, Sinan Pasha Topoyan. So the commander on the Albanian side is Albanian. The commander on the Habs